Welcome to my lecture series on contemporary European composers. Today we talk about the Spanish composer Elena Mendoza. So this lecture is structured in three major parts. First, a short introduction to the composer's background and aesthetics in general. Then second, her chamber music. And then third, two of her music theater pieces I want to talk about. Let's begin with the first part. Elena Mendoza was born in 1973 in Sevilla in Spain. Her father is an architect and her mother a museum's creator, so she was born into a family with a strong visual sensitivity. Quite early she showed interest in the arts, learning to piano and also singing. Eventually, also, this brought her to composition. And language was another interest um, she followed. Her world still is actually divided between Spanish and German, culture-wise and language-wise. She studied German linguistics, piano and composition. Her composition teachers were Manfred Trojan, a German composer who is especially well known for his operas, and Hans-Peter Kieburz. Both are actually quite different in their aesthetics and also their personalities. She said she benefited a lot from this contrast. She's now based in Berlin. There she established herself as an actually well-known composer and there she also is a professor for composition. She has composed pieces in almost all traditional genres, like solo, chamber, also a few orchestra pieces, and music theater pieces. And her pieces are today played by the most important ensembles of contemporary music in Europe, as well as at major festivals and opera houses. She also studied electronic music, and even though electronic music does not play a crucial role in her music, as only in a few pieces amplification electronic sounds are used, she said, Working on electronic sound processing and analysis helped her understand sound and therefore also composition much better. So something, something she gained benefit from for her whole work. She's now using electronics especially in her music theater works. Language was already one of her major interests as a student and still is today as a composer. This interest is also present in pieces with all vocals. So language like forms, also language like rhythms and structures are present in many of her works. This interest was intensified in her music theater pieces. In the last years she gained international recognition for them, especially Niebla and Der Fall Babel. I will mention both pieces also in my lecture. Niebla also can be seen as a culmination of several interests developed over years and which are already present in her chamber pieces. Until now she composed four operas. One of them, her first one, was a children opera. I will use the following selection of pieces to portray the composer. You can see the titles on the screen. Mendoza's work and thinking are inspired by philosophy and in some ways is philosophy itself, I would say. Mendoza is influenced by a Spanish philosophy movement called Humanismo, um, where the human being is approached as what it is a complex being between rational and irrational behavior and thoughts. It also quite directly deals with the questions of being human in general. It is not as abstract maybe as some German or Greek philosophy movements. It also does not try to create clear categories or distinctions between things. Art and philosophy are closely connected to each other, also for Mendoza. Or better said, they are mixed and blurred into each other. The boundaries between art and philosophy are fluent. In this, she shares something with Chinese art, I would say. Also, literature and especially language is very important for her, as we already know. Many of her works, especially music theater, deal with philosophical questions. Philosophy for Mendoza means um, to question reality and to accept that there are more realities. To accept that perception is something complex, experienced and something created by individuals created by body, senses, but also, of course, culture, age, social environment, and so on. This also means that strange misunderstandings, misconceptions, ambiguities, deformations, distortions, confusions, or irritations can occur. These differences, of course, also shape art in its creation and perception. Mendoza is interested in this idea of different realities, the difference between things, and also may things that are actually lead to non-logical differences. All of this can be actually very interesting for art. As art, especially music, is a wonderful place to say different things at the same time and also leave certain things a bit unclear. She shares such interest with composers like Olga Neuwert, who I introduced a few weeks ago. 
yet Mendoza's style and content are quite content are quite different. But some aspects they share, like both are interested in grotesque situations and humor. Both like uncertainty or ambiguous situations. And this she also shares similarities with the composer Lucia Ronchetti, who I presented in a lecture two years ago. Also, Mendoza's humor always asks questions and tries to uncover something. It's not just made for laughing, but for laughing and thinking about something. Yet, Mendoza composes extremely accurate and detailed. Smallest details in her music are relevant. Most of her pieces are extremely focused and usually not too long. Her music is very dense. Longer pieces usually are divided into smaller movements or parts. Because of this, it's also understandable that most of her works are chamber music pieces. She later then developed out of her chamber music also her music theater pieces as well as her orchestra pieces. Until now she composed two orchestra pieces but is working on a new one. Mendoza often used texts by writers who were politically active working also with and on their historical and political aura, among them, for example, anti-fascists in the Franco regime in Spain. Despite the power of the text she uses, she always remains a strong position also as a composer. Often the texts then are blurred and mixed with her music. They almost are dissolved in some cases. Let's move on to the second part and let's see how her philosophical ideas are also part of her music. I said before that she often integrates texts into her music making the texts become like fog, not clearly followable, yet still part of the piece. Even in pieces without a singer, this is the case. In Lo que nunca dijo nadie, please forgive my bad Spanish pronunciation, um, which means what no one ever said, title, for violin and guitar, we only hear fragments of the language, spoken by the musicians themselves. The fragments of the words are also split upon the two musicians. The instrumental music also has connections to speech-like structures and sounds. In addition, the text itself is about things we cannot speak of. I tried to translate from the Spanish original, so without uh, poetic power, just so you understand. What no one ever said, poet of the indescribable. He finally was able to express what no one ever said. They sentenced him to death. So the two central verses of the text are distributed onto the musicians. At the beginning they are connected in a clear rhythmical way, a bit like a hocket, a hocitus. If one focuses, the text remains understandable. Also the syllabs are in the correct order. But with every repetition, this connection is dissolved a bit, and so is the semantical understanding of the text. New syllable connections or combinations that are not regular words are created, but based on the old material. The distribution of the words is also a link to the different realities I mentioned before. Here we have the language divided into several realities, the words and the sound of the words distributed onto the musicians and the instruments. One cannot be sure where one reality begins and the other one starts. Like a piece heard by several different people at the same time, different perception creates different realities. Sometimes they merge, sometimes they are completely different. Contrast and fast changes are other tools that either merge or merges or creates different musical realities. Aktzeichnung means nude drawing. It's one of those pieces in which Mendoza worked on ideas that later led her to a music theater piece, in this case Niebla. Here we have a real singing voice, a baritone voice. And again, the question on how to integrate this voice into the ensemble sound was important for Mendoza. Also the voice as a physical event happening on stage. So also the singer himself and his body. Again, instruments and vocal line are merged and often are indistinguishable or imitating each other. But musical treatment is also brought upon the words and sounds of the words. Of the words. So the vocal voice is not in the foreground necessarily, but rather a counterpoint like voice in the piece. So all the meaning of the words is mixed with music, not only the sound. We cannot understand everything there, but yet it is there. The goal of the piece was also to work on the possibilities of amplification. Very soft sounds like whispering are expanded and are unusually present in the whole sound world of the piece. This was an aspect of working on physical presence of the singer. Give his voice and his body an expansion like an, in an amplified room. 
The text is taken from the novel Rayuela by Julio Cortazar. Its English title is Hopscotch. Mendoza is using a German translation of the Spanish original version. It is written in the form of stream of consciousness, so it is a continuously flowing text from the perspective of the main protagonist. It can be read in different sequences. It also has multiple endings. Some chapters give additional information to events happening before. The author offers different ways of how to read the 155 chapters, such as multiple, such a multiple way of reading or exploring a story fits Mendoza's interest in different realities and also different ways of perception. Two readers of the same book might have quite, might have quite different experiences with the book. Such interests then culminated later in her opera Niebla. Nebelsplitter, meaning fog splinter, was composed shortly after the opera Niebla. Even though it was composed after it, it still leads to the opera, similar as Aktzeichnung did. It is a piece for piano and string trio, no voice. It has four movements and all are quite dense. The piece is about 60 minutes long. Some material she took from the opera Niebla. Blurring between clear musical material and noise is happening here several times. Timbre is the main tool of blurring. The blurring is also realized by preparations in the piano, making the piano more like a string instrument. Each movement can be seen as a comment on the one before, like a critique or correction. They also play, or they again play with different realities and perception. Even though the four movements are quite different, we could see this piece as four different perspectives on the same musical material. This is where the piece and her musical philosophy is again mixed with our perception of her philosophical interests. So she shows us quite directly in her pieces what she is interested in. In the context of the opera Niebla and remembering also her approach of Aktzeichnung based on this Cortesar's open book form, um, we might also say that the four movements of Nebelsplitter could be additional chapters to the opera, each commenting something that has happened in the opera, but from a new perspective. That she used material from the opera would definitely point into this direction. We can now also say that the operas, as a culmination point, are not end points of a development, but instead major milestones in a development, which does not end with an opera. I want to return to her interest in the grotesque side of different realities, so misunderstandings, strange moments, uncanny weird situations and so on. There is a painter who is quite significant uh, and well known for his grotesque aesthetic, Francisco Goya. Often his paintings are exaggerating and are ambiguous, often also dark. Mendoza wrote a piece for solo guitar based on one of his drawings from the series Los Caprichos number six to be exactly. The drawing is titled Nobody Knows Himself. Mendoza's piece is titled Breviario de Espejismos. Goya series was made between 1793 and 1799 and was politically um, critical towards also the situation of this time. Some of his critique of society is actually still surprisingly accurate and fits even our today's society. And in there, we can also hear humor, but also the dark and strange side of these grotesque situations and misunderstandings and misconceptions. Try to hear the clashing opinions and meanings and misunderstandings in the piece, but also the dynamic and energetic, sometimes maybe manic and grotesque aesthetic of the guitar. Important for Mendoza also was to not double or recreate the picture in any way. That would, in her opinion, actually just take something away from it. The goal is to add something to it. The drawing technique by Goya, etching, was also a major inspiration for Mendoza. It is a conceptual link also between the drawing technique and the guitar solo. The line between knowing and not knowing is another major compositional concept of her piece. For musical phrases are combined again and again. Depending on their order, they change their shape, so they undergo different variations, and then also get different functions in the piece we can hear them anew every time. One time they are like a transition between two others, one time they are like a climax. But they also influence each other. This phenomenon forms the starting point of a compositional game between the familiar and the new, which is also like a game with the uncanny 
in a Freudian sense. The piece, Die Macht der Gewohnheit, meaning the force of habit for a talking violinist, can offer us an other perspective on her chamber music work, an interest in language. The violinist also has to speak. Text is composed and needs to be spoken in exactly noted rhythms. Violin and spoken word, both are music. The sound of the spoken word is combined with the violin sound. So, some sounds carry clear meaning, some again are ambiguous and not understood clearly. Sometimes they directly address the audience even. The text uses all kinds of words that are connected with habits. Again, the text is a bit grotesque. This is something we can find in several of her pieces. Here it is more on the humorous absurd side, or irony in other words. But the border of irony, absurd, grotesque, funny and awkward are fluid. It's hard to define them exactly um, within language or in general. This is why music can express them also so well. It can avoid clear definitions. Music can do this. Again, this is a kind of uncertainty that is everywhere in Mendoza's music and which creates those interesting spaces that are exciting for her, but also for us listeners. We now move on to the third part of the lecture. Her chamber operas Niebla from 2007 and her chamber opera Der Fall Babel from 2019. We will now encounter some of the already presented ideas again, formed into a music theater. Let's begin with Niebla. The opera is for 10 musicians and vocal ensemble. Niebla means mist or fog. The opera was closely created together with the director and librettist Matthias Rebstock and is based on the novel Niebla by the Spanish writer Miguel de Unamuno, written in 1914. It is again a philosophical book. The author also was a philosopher. A young man is unsure about who he is, about what life is in general. He then falls in love with a woman who walks by him on the street. But despite his efforts and also the help of others, the young woman rejects him. Also, she already has another boyfriend. The young man then meets an other girl and he starts to doubt if he really was in love with the first one from the street. He wonders if love can tell him who he really is, if love can create identity and certainty. He returns to the girl from the street and asks her to marry him and she, uh, she said yes. But a few days before the marriage, the girl runs away with her other boyfriend. Finally, the young man feels himself. The pain makes him perceive the world clearer. The fog clears up. Eventually the pain is too much and the young man wants to kill himself. He then consults the author of the novel himself on what to do. And we then realize that this young man is only a fictional character, the author in the book, who is also a real author, just invented. So this author tells the young man, because he is just a fictional character, he cannot kill himself. They argue about that and the young man also states that maybe also the author is again just a fictional character of another author. The author thinks if he should kill this character and is already too independent. The questions of the young man also questions his own existence. The book ends with thoughts on the author on how to deal with this character now. Um, it is not sure if the young man was able to kill himself. and. At the end of the book, there's a eulogy given by the dog of the young man. So we see there is some absurd material in this book and also some meta perspective material, existentialist philosophy, so to say. So this story fits again into the interests of Mendoza, it perfectly fits. We have a mix of realities, we have strange, uncertain situations, we have comical scenes, we have irony. Mendoza even amplifies some of those moments. So the opera is even more absurd, mixed and full of uncertainties than the novel. Niebla, the fog, is a symbol for the uncertainty of the realities and a blurred vision. All of this is not only in the story, but also on the music theater piece itself. The staging is also part of the opera, of course. That means it was also conceived by the composer and the librettist themselves. There is no further stage director. So the audience is sitting on both sides of the stage. The audience always only sees one part of the stage, the other one is hidden. And around them, like a surround setting, musicians and actors are playing and acting as well. Multiple realities and perspectives are also part of the staging of this opera, not only the music. The stage setting is supporting and creating the scenes and dramaturgical concept of the opera. For example, when a young man goes onto the street, 
we hear sounds coming from all directions, like we are part of an artistically formed perception, a perception of what this young man experiences in this situation. On the street he also feels good because all the many things happening give him this feeling that he exists actually and he does not question everything there. In the novel there is a more or less linear story, but the opera of Mendoza and Rebstock will work with this linearity and change it to a non-linear rearranged form. The piece itself is like a puzzle of this linear story and the audience is putting together the situations while experiencing the piece. The structure of the novel has many repetitions. The young man is several times in similar situations. Mendoza and the libertist Rebstock decided to use this and also work with repetitions, which are a bit different all the time. So there are five basic scenes, which each are repeated several times. In total, the opera has 25 scenes, a bit like a rondo. Some scenes only have music and some scenes there is more text or movement, each offering new perspectives and creating different realities, a constant variation of things from before. Different repetitions are also questioning each other's realities, similar things we encountered in her chamber music before. Also think of the idea of the developing variation in a Schönberg sense. We had a familiar idea also in my lecture on Hector Parra last week. For Mendoza, the major question in variation is if material can still be recognized as material that is underlying variation or if it already seems like new material. This is an important question. So where is the border between variation and something new? For her, this variation also creates the form of a piece. Not only for the opera Niebla, but also for chamber music. So variation is a form of changing repetition. These repetition and their differences are also part of the staging. Similar scenes are repeated, but in different positions and constellations on stage. So every time the audience hears and sees them a little bit different. Also the characters slightly change and evolve through those repetitions or musically correct variations. This opera is basically one scene in five variations. A variation or repetition in music is always closely linked to memory and the act of memory, uh, remembering. By doing several repetitions or variations, memory can then also be blurred and disrupted. Some scenes are not completely fixed in timing. Sometimes the movement of the actors in the room is quite important. The musicians have to react on that. So the music is also composed in a way that it can, can, it can be triggered by cues from the actors and their movement. Usually in music city it's the other way around, that music is the main cue giver. But there are also traditionally fixed scenes in the opera. It is an integral piece of art. Music, stage, text, movement are all reacting upon each other. They also have been created in a close collaboration between Rebstock and Mendoza again. So also the musicians have been included in the creation of the piece. Interesting is this working process. The composer Mendoza and the librettist Rebstock created the whole concept together. Many brainstorming and working sessions created this piece. They share the authorship of this opera. So it is correct to say that Niebla is an opera by Elena Mendoza and Matthias Rebstock. This is not a usual thing, not even in a more uh, open and experimental music theatre world we have now in Europe. Rebstock was heavily influenced from experimental theatre, while Mendoza was influenced from classical opera, of course, and literature. They have met somewhere in the middle for this piece. The final piece is not the score, but the performance of the piece. They already did three music theatre projects together, so they are a successful team. Mendoza is titled also co-staging and co-text author. Rebstock is also titled co-composer or later labeled Mitarbeit, meaning contribution or co-working um, to the music for this piece. This is a new, actually quite progressive way of doing opera in Europe. Not single individuals create their parts and is then combined, but a collective creates a new piece. In young experimental music theatre, this is already the case, but Often there is no fixed score and all people involved are together, creating based on their skills and ideas a new piece. Experimental theatre has been doing such forms even longer. Music theatre is a lagging behind a little bit. Even so, it is part of the music theatre world, it's still not an everyday thing to mix the boundaries between actors and musicians in a music theatre piece. In this opera this is the case. 
The singers or actors play instruments and sometimes also musicians have to act. There is no orchestra pit. All musicians and singers are in the room and are visible. They all are staged. All of this was created together by the composer, librettist and musicians. And of course the question arises if this piece can be staged in a new version, maybe by another director, or if the piece has only one way of doing it. In her opera Der Fall Babel, she again worked together with Matthias Rebstock. Again, both are each co-working on text, stage and music. The opera is based on a short segment of the Old Testament about the tower and city of Babel. It's just nine verses, so it's really short. Um, you may know it. The people of the city built the tower so high, it almost reached the sky, which is Hebrews. God was angry about this and punished them, giving the people many different languages. So they were not able to communicate anymore and were therefore not able to finish the construction of the tower. The idea is that only if we all speak the same language, we can truly work together. But think of this. If we all speak the same language, culture would also suffer. Mendoza and Rebstock took an essay by Fabio Morabito as inspiration. This essay deals with the situation of just one language world. In a future society where all speak the same language, they look back to the past with its rich diversity. They know they have lost something. Of course, this richness came with a price of contradictions and also lots of problems. Yet it created a complex, diverse world of different cultures. Those people of the future also wonder how people were able to organize their life before. So Der Fall Babel is an opera about languages, about a world between and in languages. I mean languages, plural. Mendoza and Rebstock uh, took three different stories by contemporary writers who were working on questions of cultural diversity and language. Rebstock transferred those three texts into a libretto. The piece uses four languages, German, Spanish, French and English. Every storyline has its own musical characteristics and is distinguishable from the others. For example, one storyline is mostly sung, one mostly spoken and one is mainly based upon rhythmic elements. The first one is also from Fabio Morabito and tells the surreal story of a family of translators. They live in a big house and in every corner different translations are created. Every corner also has a different theme, so different things are translated in every corner. The house also becomes the inspiration for the stage. The second story is by Japanese writer Yoko Tawada. It's about a German-Japanese woman who is searching for the language of her dreams. She first thinks it's a weird form of German and later she finds out it's Afrikaans, spoken in South Africa. She never has been there. She don't know why she dreams in this language. She goes to South Africa to learn the language. Uh, but it's not sure if she also dreams this journey. It's also, of course, a reference to the colonial history of Europe. The third story is by Cecile Weisbrot. This story is set after the Second World War and is about a young French Jewish student who needs to learn the language of her enemies, German. Every story is a basic situation. There is not so much story, but a situation, as I said. The stories are not so much about every word that is said, but also about those situations and languages themselves. Every story is told from a different perspective. A translator who learns a new language, someone who tries to understand why she dreams in a foreign language, and also the text style and staging are different for all the three stories. Towards the end of the operas, all stories are mixed up and also all their distinct aesthetics. Every scene has also another focus. The scenes of Weisbrot, um, are usually sung. The scenes of Tavada are usually with lots of percussion instruments, also mainly daily objects like salad bowl, amplified and electronically altered. The scenes of the translator family have a strict rhythm, single percussive sounds, like a translation machine or factory. They also make sounds, they open and shut books and you hear them make sounds with book pages. The piece in general is actually written for 12 singers, two actors, three percussion players with lots of special instruments and daily objects used to make sound and, in addition to that, live electronics. The work on this piece was also a research on sound objects. In this setting is also, with the 12 singers, is something like a choir opera. The piece has 13 scenes and the actors also act a little bit like narrators and also gluing together the different scenes and situations. Language is also transferred into the percussion instruments 
They are. There are dialogues between language and percussion instruments. Like in Niebla, all musicians involved are present on stage, have costumes, are part of the staging and need to act. Again, everything was developed together. Acting is as musical as the music and the music is also like it is part of the acting and stage. All are doing their part in a multi-language piece. So the whole piece is quite dense and like an ongoing fluently moving machine. Please also pay close attention to the stage design and how it interacts and also represents the whole idea of the piece. At every corner is language, different languages. All translations are made everywhere. Different topics are addressed. Books are everywhere. Right now, Mendoza continues to work on a piece which is also using daily objects. She will integrate this into an orchestra piece. The orchestra musicians have to play their instruments, but at certain moments also just use objects. This interest already used in the Fall Babel, she wants to continue on. She also still interested in the Babel topic and is thinking of new pieces in this context, also beside this orchestra piece. 